All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Nico Yilk. He's a renowned finance journalist, podcaster and fierce advocate for Bitcoin and sound money principles. With his popular Fix the Money newsletter and podcast and German-focused YouTube channel Was, Was Bitcoin Bringt, he provides insightful analysis on the flaws of the current money system and the revolutionary potential of Bitcoin. His experiences with economic crisis and understanding of economics have made him a leading voice in the Bitcoin community, and I'm excited to talk with him today. So uh, welcome, Nico. Bram, thank you for the kind introduction. It's good to see you. Yeah, man, really, really good to see you. I'm excited to chat today. We tried for a really long time, I think, uh, all, like like two, three-ish months. So now uh, now we're here. So uh, it's my, You know, it's my strategy. I waited until your, your channel has <laughs> grown a little. <laughs> well, there we go. It's, it's going great. Um, yeah, I wanted to dive into, you know, obviously you are super into Bitcoin now, but I just wanted to start with, you know, what initially sparked your interest and how has your perspective changed uh, on Bitcoin over time? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I've been, like you said, I've been doing my German Bitcoin podcast and YouTube channel now for two and a half years. It's going great. It's my main channel. I do have an English channel as well. Um, in order to stay connected to you know the broader audience outside of the extremely strong German audience, so Bitcoin in, in Germany and Austria, I'm from Austria, um, is, is a huge topic, Switzerland as well. Um, and, and it has always been a topic even before it existed, meaning that inflation on the one hand and hard money on the other hand um, has always been, a, have always been a thing um, that especially Germans and Austrians feared after their um, experiences between the wars. So we had hyperinflation, you know, I, almost everybody in Bitcoin knows about the Weimar hyperinflation. Um, Austria had, had a, a similar horrible inflationary period. And today you can still, you know, talk to people who will who will remember at least have have you know, relatives that told them about the story of you know people from Vienna going out uh, to the countryside buying, but you know taking their 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 the jewelry their gold coins whatever they had um, in order to get some potatoes right so that's like the it's really ingrained in us um, and the second the second thing after the war is the opposite um, the the Deutschmark and the Schilling were super hard currencies and we had the the the, the Wirtschaftswunder as we call it so it's the economic miracle of the 50s and 60s and 70s um, where Germany um, just rose from the ashes basically economically also because they needed to show the, the eastern part of their own country how awesome capitalism can be um, you know <laughs> yeah. they forgot about that after the reunification since then it's been going sideways or down but that's a whole different story um, and I personally I I've been working as a journalist. I, I lived in Argentina in 2008. And this is where I got in touch with, you know, the destructive forces of um, um, inflation. It wasn't that bad back then. It wasn't, you know, Argentina, I think it got like one, four pesos for one euro. So that's compared to today. It was, it was totally stable. But, you know, when you, order man, uh, if, when you order food, you would get a menu every two weeks with, you know, raised prices. And that was interesting. And I thought if that ever happened in Europe, you know, people would, would lose their shit. Um, well, it, now it is happening. People are not losing the shit, you know, as quickly as I would expect it to be. But um, after the 2008 financial crisis and then the, the euro crisis, you know, things really came undone in the, fin in the, in the, in the fiat money financial system. And, and I think Bitcoin was a reaction to that you know i i consider it i consider bitcoin an invention but absolute scarcity i consider um, a discovery you know that was necessary in order for bitcoin to work i yeah. don't know I, I i would expect at some point like with the the you know the technical possibilities and the necess necessities um for something like that i would expect you know the market to to come up with something like that uh, you know even regardless of, of what Satoshi did, but he did it or they or whoever he was or they were. Um, and I, back then when, when it started, I, I didn't know about it. I knew about it relatively re recently, but because of my experiences in Argentina and because of the experience of the, of the financial crisis and then the Euro crisis in 2010, I was already deep into the gold, Austrian economics, gold standard at first, and then you know, the so-called free gold rabbit hole when, with regards to the, the idea of using gold to recapitalize um, the financial system, starting with Europe, um, in order to you know, take over from the Americans. Long, mm -hmm. long story. 
Um, so I didn't see Bitcoin. I did buy some Bitcoin in 13, but sold it again. You know, I had my three, my, my three touch points and I'm, 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 I'm not ashamed to admit that I only got it, like really got it in 2020. Um, as a journalist, I did work before, um, off and on Bitcoin. And then of course the whole crypto stuff. I was with, a with a big Austrian newspaper. I was like the finance guy there. So I, I would always cover uh, monetary policies. I would always cover gold and then Bitcoin, but I didn't really get it. I only got it um, when I when I would least have expected it. So when I already like basically forgotten about it. And when in, in 2020, when it went down to, I think, 3000 euros, um, I thought it was dead. You know, I, I, my head was complete in a completely different place with my family and my job back then. Um, I wasn't a journalist or I wasn't working for the newspaper at that point. I was working for a, a think tank for two years between 19 and 2022. And I didn't. And, and then, of course, afterwards, when it came back, I realized, okay, shit, you know, you had your chance to get in. You had your chance to get this earlier, but you didn't. So there's two options. Either you, 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 you forget your, your stupid little ego and you get in now and you, you, you learn about it now or you, you'll be forced to do it later. So um, that's what happened. Um, and then it, it, it was all very quick for me because I already had all the, the, the puzzle pieces with me, right? Like the Austrian economics, the fiat money system, the central banking. I just didn't believe that Bitcoin could be a thing. But once you understand some things about the monetary system and then you believe Bitcoin could be a thing, that, that there's a consequence. And the consequence for me as for many in the Bitcoin space is that I really wanted to, to, to work in that field and I saw a possibility to um, combine my, my love for media um, with, with Bitcoin because I saw you know, the success of Bitcoin media, especially podcasting, Peter McCormick being one who I always listened to in the, in the English-speaking world. And I saw how quickly Bitcoin was growing in the German-speaking world. And I saw the opportunity. And uh, I have to say, I did seize it. And now my, my podcast, uh, I'm the only one who does like in-studio podcasts, right? Because that's what I learned from Peter. And of also, you know, you probably know this because you do this mostly on on, uh, on Zoom, right? It gets a little bit tiring. It's, it's, it's much nicer to just sit down together. Um, and yeah, uh, we have uh, something like uh, 300,000 downloads in a good month right now on the podcast, um, on the YouTube channel. Um, so I'm very, very happy. <clears throat> and, and, um, and we're getting just started because the, the, the great thing is that I started in the, in the bear market. So I, have, I haven't had a bull market yet. Hey there. I want to ask you for a quick favor. If you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. I love that that you mentioned that ego part, right? And and that you had multiple touch points. I think that is a common theme uh, amongst people who, who are into Bitcoin now. N not that many people get it the first time they see it but when uh, but especially with your background you would assume and this is also one of the questions i'll have after this that that you would get it right because you've been studying the problem and the reason of existence of bitcoin longer than you you know about bitcoin but what if you if you would drill down on that ego part what was the biggest thing that made you not see it or be like this can't be it, or it's too good to be true, or however you, you classified it. So I, I had a chance to do the fireside chat with Michael Saylor in Prague um, a couple of days ago, and we did tape it, and it's on my newsletter. And I just actually watched it to do, to do a German video on it for my German channel. And, and I think that he thought long and hard about this, and he came to the, the conclusion that, you know, many people are supposed to get it, like bankers and politicians mm -hmm. and you know, economists, of course, they're supposed to get it. But if you are not in the need for something like this, if you don't really see a problem, then you don't need a solution. And I didn't see, I, I, I didn't see that for my, for my personal life. And I think it is, it has to be personal first. Um, yes, maybe on an academic level, but you know, I mean, just like, 
active economists, politicians and bankers are going to be the last ones to see it. That's what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Um, and then there is many groups who had some needs to get into Bitcoin, you know, maybe, maybe they are cypherpunks, maybe they wanted to buy drugs on, or, or, or non-drugs, you know, on, on the Silk Road, but to buy something, you know. Um, then there's, of course, those who got into it for speculative reasons and those who stayed for the store of value, which I think is the most, you know, uh, is the biggest group. Um, and it's the group that is now the most important group and will be for the next, for the foreseeable future, maybe even 10 years or so. <clears throat> I don't know. I th I think I think I was like I was married to the gold story. I was already a contrarian, so I was already a dissident. I was already against mm -hmm. the system. I already had a solution, but for me it was gold. So I didn't really like I didn't want to give up uh, my story and get into another story. And especially within the the, the framework of what we would call mainstream media back then. Um, it was way too early to to start covering Bitcoin in a real sense. Today yeah. it would be possible, but today still there's very few journalists in the mainstream media who get Bitcoin and they don't get to do what I do now on YouTube and on my podcast, um, covering the whole world from a Bitcoin perspective, Yeah, right? Because Bitcoin changes everything. It changes your complete, your, your total, your view on the world. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why I think Bitcoin media is so important and Bitcoin media is so successful is because that, that, that people, you know, you can't, you can't listen to the others that like the old stuff anymore because they have a fiat perspective. They see everything through the prism of central banking or the euro or the dollar. Um, and the gold stuff, well, I mean, I still hold gold, um, but as a, as a, systematic answer to the problems i don't really see gold working anymore at least for now it could still be if um you know the, the central banks decide to bring it back into the system somehow at least raise the price but but um that's i mean i thought about this a lot i just i just didn't get it i didn't see the i i wasn't the whole and also as a as a like a financial journalist at a daily newspaper in 2016, 17, 18, you know, you had to cover all the crypto shit all the time. Yeah? There was mm -hmm. a blockchain. Every day there was a new blockchain and then the, every day there's a new story. Um, and, and you know, many people are still in that mindset. So you don't have only have to get out of the fiat mindset. First you get out, you, you get out of the fiat mindset. Then you go, then you, you go into the gold mindset. Then you have to get out of the gold mindset again. Um, then it goes into the crypto mindset. Then you have to get out of the crypto mindset again. And then finally you arrive at the Bitcoin mindset. And then and then basically you have to go back to the 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 the, the gold, the fiat, and the crypto mindset and find like little pieces that in in this world are actually still true. So it's an ongoing process. Um, I didn't get it because I didn't really need it at that point. And in 2020, I think I saw. I saw the the world break basically, and I needed to react. Yeah, yeah, fascinating perspective. I am in a Telegram group uh, with Dutch financial journalists, uh, uh, bank directors, uh, people from the Dutch National Bank, politicians, and it's it's about Bitcoin. But uh, most uh, are lurking; they read, right? Mm -hmm. But there's financial journalists in there from like the the Dutch Financial Times, and they do not understand that they still write about it as like tulip mania ponzi blah 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 and then i say in this group right like if my perspective on journalism on being a journalist is is to be like intellectually curious into infinity basically right you are um reporting on what is happening or developing in the world you know and i see how they write about Bitcoin, it's so emotional and so opinionated. And it just, it, it triggers me in a sense that my entire perception of being a journalist is not, yes. it's not that. So it's, it's really interesting to talk to you. So when I go against that, right, I say like, why do you write this? Like, it's either you get it and in a malicious way, you're now arguing against it, which is wrong anyway, or... You know, this is the biggest discovery in your professional field in your lifetime. And you were not spending time on it, which is also 
uh, dishonest in a sense, right? So and the it, same, yeah, it's the interesting. Same, the same is true for economists, and, and you know, Mike, Michael he, in his talk at, at Prague, he talked about his. Um, he was visiting Harvard Business School, the, one of the most prestigious yeah, uh, business schools in, in the world, and he said, and this was after the playbook already worked, after they already made billions for 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 MicroStrategy and the shareholders, you know, um, and all the students afterwards said well no that's not the conventional way no i wouldn't be doing it it's too risky you know i mean do you know what what i mean it's like mm. even if you if, even if confronted with it working people will still dismiss it yeah. because they do not like and 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 so the the strategy of showing them basically showing them you're wrong you know conventional wisdom is wrong it's not going to work um yeah. it's only it's 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 only like the only thing is the pressure from the market and from reality and and media especially especially what we call mainstream media what what you what what our let's not call it let's call it parents media right it's what our parents would consider media yes. media right um good term it's not mainstream main i think mainstream is wrong uh, main, the, the mainstream today has already shifted but it's 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 parents old media legacy media parents media um they are collapsing uh, they are collapsing, and they and they see um, and and they say no way out, and they are not interested in um, in fixes. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not. They are not about fi like certain people are. Yes, certain people are, but not not the the. And and then you have the the situation that you talked about journalists. Well, I think that many you know people on YouTube, many people on 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 Substack today um, are more are closer to that role of journalism that you described um than in the in the legacy media yeah um and 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 this will only continue this will only continue and and the good people will leave and will do their own thing of course there will be media you know um brands and yeah, the, the newspapers of today might survive as brands in some kind of form but it's it's if you look at your own consumption, if you look at, 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 at the numbers from young people, what they consume when it comes to media, um, we are in a, we're going into a totally different world. We're going into a world where people do not get fed information. They actually have to look for information, vet the information. Um, they have to you know, build up trust with the people that they trust. It's a completely different ballpark than to what you know, m my older colleagues are used to. And I am 40. So I am in the lucky position of, uh, I'm actually 41. I'm in the lucky position of... You're a millennial. I am officially like, the, I think I'm the first millennial generation. Yes, yes. correct. Um, yeah. but, but, and maybe that's why I still have some insight into, into the, the new world and some insight into the old world. So I really feel like somebody in between sometimes. I know how to speak to people who are in the 60s and I also know how to speak to people in their 20s. The difference is, of course, or... Any everybody who thinks that they're still young at forty one think that, that to know how to speak to see people <laughs> in their twenties, but yeah. I do have some idea of, of like like the, the media consumption there, especially because I, I know I I'm in contact with Bitcoiners, right? So the the oldest Bitcoiner I ever interviewed on my channel is eighty four years old, right? The youngest is probably twenty. Um, so so you know. People get Bitcoin at the price that they deserve and at the moment that they need it, basically. And and what I like the conviction, as long as you are like the people in your telegram group, right? As long as you are convicted of like convinced of your own um, worldview, somebody who has such conviction as some Bitcoiners have is actually count counterproductive. Because then you come over as a cult, right? Mm -hmm. um, but Bitcoins, of course, have a huge conviction. And we are only here today with all the Bitcoin meetups, the Bitcoin conferences, the Bitcoin media, the Bitcoin this and the Bitcoin that, because the mainstream never really you know, adopted us. And I think it's great because we don't really need the mainstream or the legacy media for it to do anything. You know, We build our own stuff. And we even have... With Noster and and Lightning Network, we even have infra infrastructure to monetize that, which is not you know, baseball fans have their forums, but they don't have an infrastructure to to run it on. We we even do that, so I think we're in a pretty good position. Yeah, and yeah, what you mentioned about the cult, I think, is interesting. I, yesterday, I talked to a guy who who was seventy one, 
uh, we, we had a call to meet, but he sent me an email because he listened to an episode and he said, I was in a cult for five years in the eighties. And I want to tell you that Bitcoin is the antithesis of a cult, um, <laughs> because, and I think you just used the word conviction. What I find interesting is the conviction in the Bitcoin money system comes from the understanding of what it is, right? The self-study, the self-challenge, and not the the, 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 the self-verification, and not by believing the word of a third party or a third person, which is totally uh, opposed to the fiat money world, where the people who think they have a valid opinion didn't come up with that opinion themselves. They're parroting someone else or some institution, right? And and yes. I think that's also why they will get it last, which is poetic in my uh, in my view, right? Like it, it, it's the prime example of hubris and um, you know close closed eyes, closed mind, etc. And the people who actually challenge themselves and try to change their mind and the paradigm they you know grew up in or what was taught to them, like th- those are the people that will get. Uh, rewarded in a sense, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know. Even even at, when the when the Berlin Wall came down, there were people in in the in the Politburo in in Moscow and even in Eastern Germany who said, "Great, uh, this is just a one step to the victory of worldwide communism." Yeah, uh, no, it's true. It's, I mean, first yeah, first of all, first of all, we, we we're not sure if if they weren't right, maybe uh, because because the communism is still you know a factor today, but. Um, but like, it, it, I did a talk in Prague about um, the lessons from 1989 because I see parallels between the people who were fighting for freedom within the Soviet Union, especially in Eastern Europe, with you know regards to to Moscow, and and the people who you know fight for financial freedom in in today. Um, and and one of the lessons would be that that you know a dysfunctional system. A special political, a dysfunctional political or a dysfunctional economic system will always, you know, after a while, the people at the top will not be the smartest people. Yes. And I think it's very important to be not like not cynical about it, you know. Um, and also, I, and this is something I have to learn as well. Um, Jeff Booth talks about this a lot. Uh, Michael Saylor talks about this a lot. You know, it's 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 better to build new stuff than to criticize old stuff. It's better to use your energy for something productive than to to yeah. fight something, right? And we are always like Bitcoin is often in fighting mode, and we have to bring down fiat money, and we have to do, we stop the CBDC, and this and that. You know, um, hundreds of topics, uh, which I, I, I agree with most of them. It's just a question of is this a good use of your energy, right? Or is yeah. it a good use to just build something, you know, in a slight roundabout way that they cannot stop? And and when you look at the people who are in power today, and I have to, inf- like, like the older you get, and this is scary, the older you get, and then you see, like, your, your friends from school are suddenly, you know, in the government, you know? <laughs> but you know yeah. that they're idiots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know yeah. them, right? You've, you've you've seen them eat like eat sand at the beach because and so so it's 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 and I think that this is something that we do have to realize is that the people in power the people in 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 uh, and this is not a, the people in in in, in French uh, roles especially economists um, they are just not very bright. I have to say this, really, because it's shocking, but we have to realize that. If we realize that, then it, it gets way easier to understand what's going on around us. Yeah. Um, because, because the system does not select for... for um, f- Challengers. Uh, <laughs> right. it, yeah, exactly. It, it, the system mm-hmm. it's, today, you know, it's, it, there's, let's just say there's many ways to get to the top, but it's certainly not if you're the most competent or the smartest person. That's not yeah. how to do it. I, I approach it like this when, when I talk to people about this, because if we say, you know, these people are not smart or stupid or intelligent, whatever, um, I try to keep away from it a bit. I turn it around and say, like, do you want to outsource your responsibilities over your life, you know, about uh, what is the value of the economic reward you get for your work? You know, do you want that to be defined by a third party? And 
when you understand that a third party is also just individuals, it's also just other people mm -hmm. who are trying to figure out their life and to battle their own ego and their own, you know, imperfections and all these things. Like, is that, is that what you want to do? Or do you want to empower yourself and think for yourself, right? Because you cannot, you cannot keep believing that these other people, you know, they mm -hmm. are more competent than you. No, they are also figuring it out as they live their life, right? But, but and, that's that's yeah. that's why the scam works. That's why the scam works. That's why this 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 appeal to authority works is because most people actually don't want to take charge of their own life. Most yeah. people do not want to be self-governed and don't want to take the responsibility. That's when you see when you see when it, go on YouTube, right? You go on YouTube and you look for you know panic, this that bad, you know mm -hmm. the world's coming to an end. 600,000 views, you know? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, here is what you can do right now to, to, uh, to, 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 to change your life for the better. Brackets, work involved. 600 views. Yeah. And I have to say it's not entirely true. I do see some like positive, chal like, positive movement within the, the media world where people who actually do want to help you live a better life and take more charge to get more um, exposure today. That is actually true. Um, but in the end, still, I mean, that's, this is how it works. You know, it's like there's, there's, there's two people in the world, kinds of people in the world. The one complains and, and, and analyzes everything and complains about how the world is. And he ends with, after an hour of discussion, he ends with, and this is why I decided to move here and do this and do that and me personally. And then mm. the other, like, but 99 other people will say, and this is why we need a new political system and we need to bring the old one down and we need to, you know, fight. Um, and, and I think it's more, it's more healthy to think about the things that you can actually change. And I think that Bitcoin, um, like the, the internet and, um, information technology in general and Bitcoin specifically give us an extremely powerful tool, um, that nobody has ever had before, right? I mean, this is also when Bitcoin puts the individual on a level that it has never been on. It's it, mm -hmm. you, you are now your own your own bank. You are now your own hedge fund. You are now your own sovereign state. You are now your own um, whatever you want it to be, really. But that's um, why it's so hard to understand. Also, for people, I'd say like it's that what you say sounds too good to be true. You know, sometimes I hear myself also talk and I think like, ooh, sounds like sounds like something a snake oil salesman would say, <laughs> right? Because it sounds too good to be true. But that is because, you know, we, we talked about the paradigm shift. Like that that is because it's so contradictory to the entire frame of life that 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 people know. Of course it sounds too too good to be true. You know, that yes. you can be that sovereign and be your own bank and not dependent on any other third party and all these things. It sounds, uh, but yeah. when, for many people, as, as, like I said, it sounds scary as well. Yes. So there is the, there is a difference because if you if you are brought up in a world where this is impossible, then there is only very few people who would embrace it. Those mm -hmm. who actually need to and those who want to for their own reasons, and most in the Western world are those who want to, right? So, yeah. so, so if you if you live in Nigeria or Turkey or South America, more those who need to are a, lo a lot bigger populace. Um, and and does it sound too good to be true? Yes, that's why it took me seven years. That's why I didn't yeah, exactly. buy two hundred <laughs> or two thousand. Right? It is. Yes. It also yeah. sounded yeah. too good to be true from my perspective. But when mm -hmm. you look around, I mean, we, we are living in a digital world with the ruins of the analog world all around us. Right, um, we're not mm. talking on Riverside. Uh, two years ago, we wouldn't have been doing this. Today, you run yeah. your whole your whole YouTube channel on that, and YouTube channel is basically like a tele, like a, like a TV station. Twenty years ago, a TV station would have cost you two billion euros, and you would have you know have to pri bribe a couple of politicians to get it. And 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 today, I mean, if you if you talk to somebody from even the year two thousand, right? I'm talking about this, talking about. The, Describe the iPhone to him, right? He would have said it's too good to be true. Yeah. Right? And this is only 20, 24 years ago. Um, so, so I think that the lessons from the digital project and the digital revolution that we've seen in the last couple of um, years is that, you know, many things that are, that sound too good to be true come true. And it makes total sense for me that 
in in when you think about it, of course, there needs to be a monetary system in the digital world, and and only Bitcoin gives you the perspective. Only like only those who understand proof of work um, understand that Bitcoin is the only option for this. Really? Yes. Uh, because you know what are we gonna use? Are we gonna are we gonna use six hundred different fiat currencies or twenty thousand dif different cryptocurrencies? And yes, of course, in the real world, the dollar. Be it on, as a digital dollar or be it on stablecoin rail, uh, uh, crypto rails, the dollar will play a, an important role going forward. Um, it's not like Bitcoin is going to just, you know, disappear all that, um, even the euro or whatever. But, but, um, but it, you know, you're from, you're from the Netherlands. I'm from Austria. We use, we use uh, English. Because English is decentralized, nobody owns it, nobody controls it. I can talk, I can use my accent, you can use your accent. Bitcoin is the English of the financial markets. The dollar is, you know, I don't know, a, a, a slightly more successful version of Esperanto, I guess. <laughs> Some dialect, yeah. <laughs> Some dialect. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. not hating on the dollar. Is what I'm saying. You know, if yeah. if you need the if you need tether in 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 Argentina or in Turkey right now, I'm happy that you that you have access to it. Yeah. So, in, in your view, is is money is money a social construct, and if so, what are the implications of that? Because, like, my thought behind that is, eventually, you know, fiat money does not work for everyone because it's not an organically adopted money, right? Even even my country said no to the euro in a sense. So, how? What do you think about when, when, when people look at history, they talk a lot about organic money, you know, with the beads and the sand, you know, and it has all their flaws. But a lot of honor money is not, it's not organic, not like the example of, you know, in prison, cigarettes are money mm -hmm. because, it, I mean, you know, where I'm you, getting at? Uh, yeah. So uh, have you heard about uh, Mises regression theorem? So Ludwig von Mises is one of the Fakely. so he's one of the big guys in Austrian eco economics, right? You can reading him today is amazing. He is a bit dogmatic about the gold standard, but you know he he was a real brilliant writer, and you know it's easy to read him. It's like he wrote it yesterday, and also the topics that he talks about are is like he wrote it yesterday. And one of his contributions to economics is the regression theory. It basically states that in order to be something for f to be used as money today it needed some sort of value yesterday. So we need some reference um, mm. that we can use. So basically, even if you, if you um, use seashells, you know, somebody needs to, to, to hoard those seashells and give them some sort of value before, and then you start exchanging them maybe as, as for trade, and then you know, the practice kicks off. So what I'm saying is that even our money today that we use, it can all be explained by regression theorem. With the euro, um, you go back to to Schilling, you go back to Deutschmark, you go back to, what did you have in... in, in Gilders, Gilders, Florin. Right? You, you, yeah, the Florin, right? The Florin was, the Florin even as a word, it goes back to the, the, the gold coin of the, uh, I think, 1600s. Yeah. Um, which actually is one of the best examples uh, for Bitcoin uh, in the in, in past, and that's why it's the first chapter of Nick Batia's great book, Layered Money. Um, so, so I I actually so what I'm saying is that I I do disagree that that the money we use today or the currency we use today is not um, organic. Um, the market in the end is stronger than than any any um, um, law, but the laws of course help, right? Um, so there is some organicness in our money today. It goes back to the gold standard. The names go back to. To, to times when, you know, it was tied to gold. Um, the mm. pound sterling was a pound of silver uh, at some point. It was tied to silver. Yeah. Um, so this this stuff, you know, the Florin the, is in, 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 in Hungary still, the name still goes back to, to that. Um, but I, I do also get what you're saying is that, that um, you know, we haven't seen the market forcing, the market monetizing these, these monies. And this is true. So I think it's important to, to differentiate between, um, and I, I, it took me a while to understand this, but it's also something you know I, I talk to about, I talk about with my guests now, and something that I talk to, uh, to to Michael about is like there's there's money, there's currency, and there's capital. So 
currency, and so money is the, the, the name that's above them all. So money can be either currency or capital. Money, yeah. money can be used for as a unit of account, unit of transaction, or a store of value. Yes? But, yeah. but unit of account is not doing anything. Unit of account is something that's only happening in your head or an Excel sheet. Yeah. If using it as a store of value is doing something. Basically, you put it somewhere, you put it on a, on a balance sheet, uh, or you put it in a saving, sa safe deposit box, whatever, and using it as a currency is all do, also doing something. You're using it uh, at a high frequency. You're exchanging it. Yeah. Um, the fiat currencies of today are mostly designed to be um, um, payment rails, right? So they're mostly designed to be uh, to, to, for, for unit of transactions. They are very, very bad store of values. So the capital that we use today for, for, for our form of capitalism, um, uh, um, and I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, make too much um, ad advertisement for my talk with Michael, but I also don't want to use his arguments, so I'm going to say this is from him. But the capital that we use for our form of capitalism today is just not very good. It's defective um, because it's not a good store of value. A government bonds are not a great store of value, neither is real estate or, or stocks. They are a better store of value than than other stuff, right? So American government bonds and American currency is a better store of value than Turkish currency or, or, or um, Argentinian currency. Um, and uh, real estate is a better store of value than, than any currency and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but they all have their, their problems. So Bitcoin is the first store of value that is designed to be a store of value. Mm. And I think this is extremely, extremely important. Um, because that's the basis for everything else. That's the basis of capitalism. And that's why, yeah. that's also what Nick argues in his brilliant book, Layered Money, because he said, first you, you fix the base layer, right? And then yeah. everything else gets built on top of it. Yeah. So it's store of value before a medium of exchange. Absolutely. Right? I have to be able to store it into the future before I can use it for whatever I want to uh, spend it on. But I, I, I think this is a really good point, right? This is, I think this ties in to how I see Bitcoin as in, I see Bitcoin not as an investment asset, but as a savings asset. And I think, you know, that is in line with, with store value in a sense. If I get euros or dollars for the, for the value that I give in, you know, whatever exchange I am involved in, I can use part of that reward dollars or euros to, you know, pay for my food. But anything I want to store into the future, I use another asset for that we can call money, right? It falls under money, as you say, but it's it's the store value aspect that, that I use Bitcoin for because the euro and dollar have lost that ability to be the savings vehicle. And that's also that's also what, what we learn from the regressive theorem, right? It needs it needs to have a store of value function first because before you can use it if you want to use it as a currency or a unit of transaction. And this is yeah. this is if you look closely, this is also one of the big fights within the Bitcoin because technically Bitcoin sector, the Bitcoin world, because technically, yes, technically I can send you SATs right now. I am totally fascinated. So one of the, the things I think Bitcoin will be adopted as a store, as, as, a, as a currency and a, a um, unit of exchange, is anything that cannot be done on fiat rails on the internet. So Nostr, for example, something mm. like or, or podcasting 2.0, like streaming money, you know, um, stuff that really does not work within the fiat rails. But then we still have the problem with regulation. So we, there's the, some some open questions here. Um, and the questions when it comes to using Bitcoin as a store of value and as capital, these questions have mostly been answered now. This is why Michael is talking about the, the Bitcoin gold rush starting with the ETFs. So it was basically that was the, the start, the, 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 how do you say, it was the, mm -hmm. the starting point, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, yesterday I also saw, or maybe it was Nick actually who tweeted that also before, but for certain final settlements of really big numbers, right? That, mm -hmm. that also are not uh, very well done on a, on a fiat rails. Let's say you have to settle uh, 1 billion plus. A, a final settlement through Bitcoin with, you know, within one hour across the world at any time to anywhere from any, anywhere. Yes. You know, th that is already fast enough. Uh, and I, I agree with you. There's a lot of, uh, of course, because in the in the in the white paper it says you know it's a peer to peer uh, 
money Ele electronic cash the electronic system. cash system but but there's think, a, well yes good point yeah go for it there's the question <laughs> there's the question how do what, what is cash right how do we define yeah. cash yeah because the first idea that we get is you know we use it for payments but you can also see it as a as a bearer instrument as a final exactly set, because a final when set people think about cash they they have the the bills in their hand but the bills are also an abstraction of the actual you know uh Ba the, the, the bills are not the base layer of the value, uh, something Bitcoin can be, right? And, and, I, and I think that's where the big difference is. And we talked about why does it, why does nobody get it in the in the in the or, or, why do so few people get it in the so-called mainstream world? Well, one of the reasons is that we Bitcoiners we we we, we use many you know narratives. You know, there's always this different stories. This is true. This is true. So one of the one of the things that you can do is you go back to the original sources, which is Satoshi Nakamoto and what he writes about. But and this is also interesting. I think it's important. By definition, he knew what he wanted to do on the technical level. He knew that he wanted to fix the money. That's why I called my newsletter "Fix the Money," by the way, and because it was still free to fix the money Substack uh, uh, subdomain handle. Yeah. Um, but he wouldn't. I mean, he had no like no possibility to know where it would lead. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, can, I agree. We can. It's not, his word is interesting and important. It's not gospel. He doesn't under, Like he couldn't understand or he couldn't see where this would lead. Um, and of course, you can say maybe it goes the wrong. I mean, some people have argued that we need to go with their fork because it was Satoshi's vision, right? But who knows who, what Satoshi's vision really was? And even if you know uh, visions, you know. If you have uh, in German, we say if we have visions, go to the doctor. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, so um, we don't know that. What we do know is that 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 there is a problem in our current system. That um, let's just say, if you had an asset that you could store your value in that appreciated by fifty, sixty, maybe thirty, or forty, or twenty percent a year. Who would not do that, really? Right? I mean, we are yeah. like pe people. People buy. This is also interesting. You know, we say number go up, right? And and then we say, ah, you can't say number go up because people. No, no. That's basically the argument for the stock market, and it's basically the argument for real estate. Like, of course, hundreds yeah. of billions, thousands of billions get invested into the stock market and into real estate because somebody says, well, it's not gonna go down. Don't worry. So but it's going funny, up. right? It's, you know what I think is funny? When you think about number go up, we think about the price in, increasing, right? But if this is a better store of value than, you know, fiat money, then the price is increasing, but also because fiat money is, is crashing, right? So I think it should more be like value go up. So not price go up. But value go up, like because whatever you want to do with the value, economic value or energy, you know, as Saylor says, that it's, doesn't that doesn't really matter. And price and value is not is not the same thing. No, but I it, think also that that's what's conflated in fiat. Money, so the thing mostly. is that the thing is that that um, I have this 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 series on my on my German channel with Peter Kotosek, who is the 84-year-old Bitcoiner. He has been in Bitcoin since, it was, uh, since 2012. And he's cool. 84 years old. He's an artist and an entrepreneur, but he's an entrepreneur first. He's, he's basically, they once called him the Austrian Bill Gates when he was like the first guy to do computers in the 60s, right? 60s and 70s. Cool. He, in, yeah. he and his company, they built all the computers that are still running today in the, in the basements of the ministries and the banks and, and whatnot, right? Um, and he made a lot of money doing that. Very successful. And he's also an artist, so he always tries new things. That's why he went into Second Life. And after he had problems in Second Life, he went to Bitcoin. And and he's a fascinating guy. He's also uh, a shareholder of MicroStrategy. He watches every single Michael Saylor interview at 84, every single Michael Saylor interview. And he also, in the I think it was 80s, 90s, he, he did a book. Uh, he was He was writing in a book. And it was it was the opposite of the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome was asking what are the, the limits to to growth, right? And they mm. were asking what is actually what is actually the, the the reasons for growth. Where does growth come from? We like growth. We want more growth. You know, screw you and your limits, right? Yeah. 
and, and he was writing an article about, and this was long before Bitcoin, he was writing an article about how do you even measure growth? Because, because, because like you said, our fiat money, our, our uh, gross domestic product, everything that we, that we measure and count in dollars or euros is, is you know, the measurement stick always stick changes. Stick is wrong. Yeah, exactly. It's a number. Yes, exactly. Yes. So it makes no sense. But of course, one of the reasons why, we, why, we, why, we, why we, we might now see things that we haven't seen before with Bitcoin is because we didn't have anything like Bitcoin. We could not measure. There wasn't anything to measure with, right? Um, and, and he's comparing it to, to the meter. So he says once we, we, however we got there, but once we define that this is the meter right now, right? The meter mm -hmm. is this long, it's not this long, and not this long. Then we could start measuring things. So Bitcoin yeah. is the only constant in the whole economic universe. The only thing I can count, I don't know how much gold there is. I don't know how many dollars there are. I don't know how many houses there are in the world, right? There's, it's all, it's all um, um, you know, ex approximations, but it's never definite. With Bitcoin, we have a definite, we, we absolutely know how many Bitcoins there are in the world and how many Satoshis and whatnot. So we fir for the first time in human history, we have the option to actually measure stuff. This was never, yes. never like economic, economic measurement was not possible before Bitcoin. So I think, I mean, that makes me very bullish. <laughs> and, and so this is where all the idea of repricing everything in Bitcoin comes from. And of mm -hmm. course, and this is for many Bitcoiners, this is also going to be hard to accept because, because he sees this. And I think that Michael Saylor sees this too, that the state will play a role here. The state will play a role in saying, okay, we are adopting Bitcoin as a measurement. We are doing this now, and we we'll, we force everybody else to do it as well because that's how it's gonna that's how it's gonna yeah. work, right? Um, it's not the, gonna be the market alone. The market decided on gold, but in 600 BC, King Krösus in Lydia was the first one to actually standardize the size of the gold coin, stamp it with his face. They over they started with their faces immediately. For some reason, face is just the way to go with coins, right? Stamp it with his face. And lo and behold, today we still talk about Grosus as the richest man in the world because he offered a standardized currency to trade and everybody loved it because, because it's easier to actually measure stuff with it, right? And yeah. the same story goes for the Florint uh, in, 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 uh, in Europe in, I don't know, Maybe 15, 1600. I don't want to say something stupid, but you can read it in Nick's book. Um, it, yeah. was, it was a gold coin printed by Fiorentina, which was, yes, a city state, but basically like a, like a the private entity within the, 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 the world of, of, of governments back then. And they knew as long as they provide the world with the service of, of a non, you know, diluted coin, a really, really good gold coin, they profit as well. Right? Yeah. This is why Bitcoin is so fascinating, because in that sense, it's not new, right? We know that uh, hard money standards have true. have worked before, right? Um, I, I didn't know what you just said about uh, Fiorentina, but it ma makes total sense. Like that, doing that, creating that coin is basically a public service. Yes. Um, and I, I, I think that w what is nice about Bitcoin, though, is because compared to uh let's stick with fiorentina right there were people there that could have corrupted it or maybe they did i don't know the entire story right but i think with bitcoin you cannot corrupt it so once a government adopts it they have to adhere to that that ethos that bitcoin then basically inflicts on them or or forces them to adhere to and that is what i think is the, is like the groundbreaking world changing thing that once you adopt it, you cannot unadopt it anymore because it will bring you way more value than you know l letting it go again. And I love what you said about the meter. I'm actually working on an essay that is called "Bitcoin is the standard uh, measurement for human productivity." You know, if if we want to value our time and finite time and energy against something that that represents a reward, it should be something that is also finite and now we are being rewarded with something that's infinite which is not the right measurement because as you said it's changing all the time and if you look at different countries if if three people do the exact same thing deliver the same value but one lives in the uk the other in congo and the third one in america they all get rewarded at a different 
value level, that's why, which is that, very weird. That's why in our fiat system, rich, rich people, you know, don't hold currency. Exactly. They don't. They, yeah. they don't. They, yeah. they hold negative currency. They're over levered. They go into debt in order to to speculate mm -hmm. against the currency. That's what rich people yeah. do. And, and and poor people are the ones who are actually save in currency. It's completely yeah. upside down. <laughs> yeah. Wild. Okay. I want to be mindful of your time. What uh, when you're looking at the clock? How, um, so how long do, do we let's, have left? Let's do ten more minutes. Okay. Okay. Cool. Then I'll ask you this. How do you define risk in financial terms? Do you think Bitcoin is risky? So I am not an expert for risk because risk is a very, very loaded, very, very interesting economic concept, right? Um, I don't think that it's like, um, if I talk about if Bitcoin is risky, I would not be talking about like it from the perspective of maybe... Um, Uh, Greg Foss, who has spent famously spent 30 years in a, in a risk chair and knows <laughs> yeah. about risk, and I don't, right? But if you ask me if it's risky to invest in Bitcoin or it's risky to, to I mean, what, what's the question? Is it risky to invest in Bitcoin or? I don't know. I think people, uh, well, I do know. I mean, more like people, you said investing, it's funny because I use saving. Right, so yes. I see myself as a very risk averse person, person, and somewhat mm. of a control freak. And <laughs> for me, Bitcoin is the most logical and rational thing to save my my monetary energy in. So for yes. me, it became less risky. But if you hear people talk about it, you know it's new and whatever. Like they, it's deemed risky, same as with like it's volatile or it lacks intrinsic value or whatever. So no, it, it I just needs, want to get your needs, perspective of, so, on how so you look at it. It needs courage and it needs some conviction in your own opinions. And yes. it, needs, it needs like, you, you need to be able to um, Like risk not only your money but parts of your reputation. You know, people could laugh at you, right? Um, but but once you've done it and once you come out of the other side, you feel a lot better because because you know it's not that bad. Um, and people actually, like I said, most people just want to, you know, not do anything really. You know, they just want you know to be told what to do and to to. To, to do what they're told, you know. Today, like, okay, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. This is interesting. You got into Bitcoin very early, right? Yes. So let's like... Well, semi-early, 2013. So yeah, that's pretty early. Um, yeah. Back then, you know, I don't even know what the scene was back then of people who would, oh, like, mostly techies and cypherpunks and, you know, people. Yeah, people yeah. yeah. So then we had... A phase, and this is also. Then we had a phase. Um, I, I, will, I will say between maybe sixteen, seventeen, and twenty twenty was the phase of craziness, right? That was the phase where every everybody, everybody tried something, and, and you know, many people you know came up with their own blockchains and 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 the crypto stuff and 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 very 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 basic work in the Bitcoin sphere. Now, I am, maybe I'm already like the first, the beginning of the, the boring, the more boring phase, right? You know, like, 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 mm. like, uh, you know, when, 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 when Jürgen Klopp came in uh, into Liverpool and he talked about, you know, some, some people call themselves the special one, I'm the normal one, right? So now we have we have people who are already losing their hair and wearing shirts and talk about Bitcoin in a more broader sense and try to make it, you know. Um, so what I'm saying is that the longer time, of course, it's there, it's less risky to, to, to go into this field. And we see this today. And now with the ETFs, there's another, you know, marker that it's not so risky, right? Um, and, and and one of the most important markets because people were super worried about Bitcoin being being banned or whatever. Now it's not going to get banned, so so it's get, it's becoming less risky to get into Bitcoin on a on a reputational level. And the money stuff, well, yeah, 
I think people are more worried about the reputation and, and, and what others will think than about the money anyway, because people, you know, I could buy Bitcoin and not tell anybody about it. And then my money is in there. And if I lose money, I don't tell anybody. And if I win yeah. money, I don't tell anybody. But either way, it's a hard thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. Doing this, this stuff in secret. So it's not like... I don't think it's risky anymore, really. I think today it's it's risky not to get into Bitcoin. I think we have crossed the the Rubicon when it comes to that. Um, but I like I'm only here because that's the reason. I I, I knew you know, when I started, I was eight, uh, 38. I already had a career in journalism. Um, I I have a family. I you know I can't just you know jump into the into the lake and hope I don't freeze. I have to have some plan of coming out again. Yeah. Um, and, and so far it's been working out well. And I think it's great. The people I meet, you know, the people Bitcoin attracts some of the smartest people that you could meet, you know, it's also a social network. I can go to any city in the world, uh, go to a telegram group, go to Twitter, go to the orange P lab, find other Bitcoiners, hang out with them. Um, and it's going to be a great evening. You know, it's, 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 it's an amazing place to be in and it. And one of the main reasons why it attracted me is because people are optimistic and people want to build a better future. And, and if that's something that, you know, is risky, then yes, then, then that might be risky, but that's a risk that I'm absolutely willing to take. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm, I'm now that I asked you the question and I hear your answer, I'm thinking about it as well, but I think it brings more uh, like, like one thing stuck, uh, stood out and I, I've said that before as well once you experience that it gives you the confidence to follow your own qualities and values and intuition th that is what the real um value is at least for me with regards to bitcoin the fact that you can trust your own mind that you know you did the work to figure out you know, what is this thing? How does it contradict to what I've learned? Is that what I really believe? Or what is my new belief? You know, and that you, exactly like you say, you see all these different people from around the world gravitate towards this thing. Like that is a signal by itself. You yes. know, and any any Bitcoiner you meet, you you have a certain level of understanding because people did that work, that personal work. And, and that is just, uh, that, that is really hard by itself. And that creates, I think, uh, yeah, you can fly anywhere and meet Bitcoiners. Like that is the network state. That is the digital state of humans uh that that balaji uh, yes, you're right, for example right. talks about it's right like slowly that, that developing. Is this already it's slowly yeah. developing and it's, it's something that you know you want to be part of once you've seen it um and it's something that i am very glad to be part of and it's something and it, and it develops almost in secret really you know we talk openly about it but people won't understand yeah, yeah people don't pay attention <laughs> yeah um and 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 it's it's and it, the thing is also, I mean, I told you I came into Bitcoin very late. I don't even like own a lot of Bitcoin and I don't care. You know, one of the reasons why I can do this is because I don't really like, I never invested a lot because, because, you know, being out in the open, um, you don't want to, you know, run around and say, people, you, you, I have lots of Bitcoin. I don't because I only got into Bitcoin when it was in the five figures, right? So I, mm. and I didn't have any money. So, but I don't care. Because Bitcoin is also good for you if you don't if you don't own a lot. It doesn't matter. It, does, it does not matter. It, it doesn't matter how how much you own. It yeah. doesn't. And it's 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 just like I I only look into the future and of like the value that I can provide and then maybe the money I can make. But with my company, but but I like I think the most important thing. That's why 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 uh, Michael talked about you know um, hope dot com right. Um, it gives you a perspective into the future. And yes. the fiat system that we come out of, it gives no perspective anymore. That's what you see in mainstream media. You know, the young people stop working, you know, they, they, they glue themselves to the, to the pavement or something, but they don't go work anymore. They're frustrated. They're, they're, they're mentally ill. They're, uh, they don't have children. They don't have children because they, so it's, it's, it's a complete shit show. Um, mm. and, and, and Bitcoin will fix this. I'm very, very like on the, on the, but of course, if you talk like this to somebody who is not into, in deep as, in, as Bitcoin as we are, if you start talking about like this with your, mm. uh, friends, when, uh, when, when you go out, watch the football, have three beers and then, you know, Bitcoin yeah. will fix the family. Yeah. Well then, yes, you sound like a moron. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
We'll take it for now, right? We'll take it. We'll take it for now. It's, fi it's fine. All right, last question. And I ask everyone the same question. What is a core belief you will never let go? Only the individual thinks, only the individual acts. That's Ludwig von Mises. So I do believe that we are social animals. I do believe that we live in communities and we form communities and that, that we basically do all of this for community. But we do not think or act as a community. Like uh, Margaret Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society. You know, um, there is there is you know constructs that we use, mm. um, and it's very important that we have them. I think it's not like saying that only the individual thinks or individual acts have nothing to do with egotistical behavior. It's only a, a, like a matter of nature, basically. You know, um, and the, the 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 smallest minority is the individual. Um, and I think that we have forgotten about that, especially in the in the West. And we should, you know, rediscover that because that's the strength that we had in the Western world and in Europe once upon a time. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. I really enjoyed this conversation. It it took us a long time, but I think we we talked about a lot in just an hour. So I'd love to do that again in the future, I and hope you uh, I will make sure to if link, you, did, uh, it would you know, to your social you profiles and, review and subscribe uh, fix on the money podcast and your YouTube channel so uh, people can. It will help us educate more well. millennials on so, the importance uh, yeah, man, of Bitcoin. Again. Bram, thanks, thanks for following. Me. All the best me on to Twitter. You. I'm Bramke. Cheers, that's man. at B R A M K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.